today we're going to start talking about chapter 20. Let me lose this, this mask here. We're going to start talking about chapter 20, chemistry of the carboxylic acid family. And we've gotten a little bit of an introduction of this in the earlier chapters. We've learned about basic reaction of nucleophilic sub acyl substitution. We're going to be seeing this more today. We're going to focus on the chemistry of, first of all, the group, the nomenclature, but then specifically on sun spectroscopy, but then on uh, reactivity of acid chlorides and anhydrides, which are the most reactive members of the class. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Just by way of reminder, of course, carboxylic acids are sort of what I think of as the parent compound. The carbon is in the plus three oxidation state. Esters, or other members of the family. I'll just write these out here. Amides, all different types of amides, primary, secondary, tertiary, just depending on the number of R groups on the nitrogen. Acid chlorides, which as I said, we're focusing on today in terms of their reactivity. Acid anhydrides molecules where you've built up, put two carboxylic acids together. The word anhydride, literally anhydrous removal of water, it's basically two molecules of carboxylic acid together with the removal of one molecule of water, sometimes called acid anhydrides. And then I said before, sort of off as the distant cousin or the cousin nitriles. We've already gotten to see C nitriles. All of these functional groups not only are re related by the oxidation state of the carbon, but they also all can be interconverted by various reactions. And we're going to be seeing that. But basically, it shouldn't surprise you that you can go from one to another with member of the family with suitable reagents, catalysts, and so forth. And you'll be learning some of these reactions. In terms of the nomenclature, let's start with esters. We've already started with, we've already talked about carboxylic acids. We've talked about pentanoic acid and benzoic acid and the casual name acetic acid, which is for the formal name ethanoic acid, but let's start with esters. So in terms of the anatomy, you have a portion of the molecule that corresponds to an acid and a portion of the molecule that corresponds to an alcohol. And we'll see the, among other things, the Fischer esterification reaction where you can just heat up a carboxylic acid and an alcohol in the presence of acid and bring them together to form an ester. So literally, it's not just that there are these two parts, they can be made together. So in terms of the name, you get the, shall we say, first name, oops, you get the, the first name of an ester from the alcohol and the last name from the carboxylic acid. So this molecule here is the ethyl ester of butanoic acid. So we call it ethyl butanoate. And you'll notice we've just taken the butanoic and changed that to A T E at the end. So that's your basic, basic nomenclature. This would be methyl benzoate. So no, no real surprises here. Also in terms of anatomy, if we look at amides, 
it's not too hard to see in the same fashion that an amide comes from a carboxylic acid and an amine. As I was saying before, and I want to remind you of this, you can't generally make synthesize an amide by mixing an amine and a carboxylic acid. We've talked about this before. You'll get an acid base reaction. And so we'll learn about special reagents to facilitate this reaction. For example, your book talks about the reagent dicyclohexyl carbodiimid, and that's the one we'll present in the class. In my laboratory, one of the reagents we use for this is diisopropyl carbodiimid, identical reagent, different R groups on it. And the reason is the DCC, dicyclohexyl carbodiimid, which um, was originally used is a horrible uh, allergy sensitizer. In fact, one of my lab members developed such horrible allergies to not DCC, but related compounds that she could no longer work in the laboratory. And other people who have worked at it have developed horrible rashes and dermatitis. So for the class, we will use D DCC. For your research, I suggest you use DIC. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. So in terms of anatomy, this molecule, which comes from hexanoic acid, becomes hexanamid. Oops. And so I'll just sort of emphasize what we've done. We've simply substituted the last oic acid. Hexanamide is what we would call a primary amide. Meaning that it, there are no other substituents on the nitrogen. Unlike a primary amine, or for that matter, any amine, the nitrogen of an amide isn't basic. In fact, and I'll show you later with the resonance structure, it's really sp2 hybridized. Its lone pair isn't, isn't available uh, for readily available for protonation. Again, maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. One of the reasons why I'm talking about naming these molecules is I think really in order to understand molecules, I think you first need to sort of recognize them and look at the, the parts and be able to identify the parts of the functional group. In some of the homework problems, as well as some of the reading in your chapter, your textbook goes over really beautiful molecules, natural products that come from various sources, molecules that are used as medicines, drugs. And the first thing is basically to be able to identify the functional groups in the molecule and then realize that this big hairy molecule like taxol isn't really any different than these small, very small molecules that I'm writing over here. So coming back to amides, if we go ahead and put a 1R group on the nitrogen, we have a secondary amide. I'll go ahead and write that down here. This molecule is N-methylacetamide. So as I said, it's a secondary. And so it's from methylamine and that N designates that the methyl group is on nitrogen. If I were typesetting this, I would write the methyl, the N in italics, you could underline it as a way of indicating that, but I'm not going to do that. All right, a molecule that we use commonly in my lab, I'll write the 
write the methyl groups explicitly here is NN dimethylformamid. It's commonly used as a solvent. It's a tertiary amide. You'll notice there are no hydrogens on nitrogen. It might be confusing the first time you see this. If you're thinking, you say, well, okay, he said this came from an amine. And so that amine must be dimethylamine. And that's a secondary amide, a secondary amine, but a secondary amine, when you put one more substituent on it, becomes a tertiary amide. The other thing that I'll point out, I think sometimes beginning students get confused looking at amides and esters of formic acid. So you look at dimethylformamide, and I've certainly seen beginning students say, oh, it's got a carbonyl with a hydrogen. That's an aldehyde. But no, it's not an aldehyde. It doesn't behave like an aldehyde in its chemistry. So an aldehyde, for example, would react readily with amines to form imines. An aldehyde would easily be oxidized to the corresponding carboxylic acid. An aldehyde would be very electrophilic at the carbonyl group. And an aldehyde would have an absorption in the IR for the carbonyl stretch about 1725 or thereabouts wave numbers, maybe 17, 1720 wave numbers or thereabouts. Whereas here, the carbonyl we'll see is in the 1600 range. The, and as I said, the reactivity isn't as such. So that's, that's just one thing to keep in mind as sort of a pro tip. If you have two different groups on a tertiary amide, so like this molecule over here, you would just name the two different groups on nitrogen. So you would name this as N-isobutyl, N-methylbutanamide. I'm alphabetizing the groups, so isobutyl I, comes before methyl M. Anyway, okay, the other thing that you will see, and I know again from experience that beginning students often find this confusing when they first see a cyclic molecule, and it looks like a whole different animal, just like I think people may look at an al a, like a, a formate ester or a formamid, and say, oh, it looks like an aldehyde. A cyclic ester is just another form of an ester. It's got a special name, a lactone. And as I said, it's just a cyclic ester. And so if you're thinking about the alcohol part of the molecule and the carboxylic acid part, they're in the same molecule, like so. And I already said that in ester, you're basically removing a molecule of water from combining an alcohol and an acid. And we'll see how that occurs. But a lactone is just another, another variant. I have talked before about positions on molecules. I've talked about the alpha position, the position next to a carbon, uh, a carbonyl group. Um, in fact, your textbook will gives you a little reading in the last chapter on alpha amino acids. I didn't cover that only because I thought the explanations were really quite clear there. They go into uh, isoelectric points and so forth. But that position one off of the carbonyl is the alpha position. 
one over is the beta position, yet one over is the gamma position, and yet one over is the delta position. If you go to a fraternity, you should know all of these letters. You'd use them in capital form. These are the lower lowercase forms. Anyway, specifically, it is a delta lactone. If you had a smaller ring, it would be a gamma lactone or a beta lactone. Ditto for cyclic amid. This molecule here is a lactam cyclic amid. And I'm not going to go over the nomenclature of these molecules. <clears throat> only because they actually get named as the corresponding heterocycle if you want to be formal about it. So the molecule I've drawn on the right here is N-methylperolidone because it's named after perolidine, which is the saturated um, version of, uh, of a five-membered ring with a nitrogen, the saturated amine and there's a, a, a carbonyl group on it. And there are other, other ones. So for example, this gamma lactone is named as a hydropyran derivative, but let's just recognize that these are just a flavor of ester and a flavor of amide. There are slight differences in reactivity of the cyclic molecules, particularly the cyclic esters. They tend to be a little bit more electrophilic. They can be subject to what's called ring opening polymerization to make polyesters because the linear esters are more stable due to what are called stereoelectronic reasons, reasons involving overlap of orbitals that you would learn about in a more advanced course. All right. In terms of continuing to sort of talk our way through various members of the family, this molecule here is an acid chloride. It's an acid chloride derived from pentanoic acid. And so its name is pentanoyl chloride. And again, you would see the OIL coming from pentanoic acid. There are certain names that are just so woven into casual use, and I've talked about this before with acetic acid, that we almost never would use the proper name. I wouldn't call, at least not while talking, wouldn't call acetic acid ethanoic acid, right? Ethanoic, propanoic, butanoic, pentanoic, hexanoic, heptanoic, octanoic, et cetera. I would call it acetic acid. And this molecule, although it would be ethanoyl chloride, everyone would call it acetyl chloride. And that's just sort of basic literacy. For anhydrides, they get named from the acid from which they are created by the removal of water. So this anhydride here is, comes from benzoic acid. So it's called benzoic anhydride. If you've got a cyclic molecule, and again, I think for many students, the first time around cyclic molecules can be confusing. If I go ahead and react an amine, and we'll see this in a moment when I talk about reactivity of acid and hydrides, if I react an amine with acetic anhydride, I get a molecule of, of acetamide and a molecule of acetic acid or and methyl or methyl or met or ammonium acetate, because it will involve two equivalents of amine. If many people, and I will give you this as a heads up, for the first time encounter a cyclic anhydride, this one is called phthalic anhydride, it comes from phthalic acid, 
if they try to think for the first time about what happens about with that molecule reacting with a nucleophile, the first time they may get confused, well, the nucleophile, as we'll see, is gonna to add to the one, one of the carbonyl groups and the ring will break open. Uh, if I allowed phthalic anhydride to react with ammonia, I'd get an amide group on one side and I'd get the carboxylic acid, or as I said, more specifically, the acetamide, the amide on the other hand. I'll just show you what I'm talking about. Since I've already sort of dropped a hint at this. So anyway, we will come to this in a moment. So I think, I think that's all I wanted to talk about naming these molecules. And as I said, this is really for us to be able to understand and to internalize what these molecules are. Any questions at this point? All right, I would like to talk about physical properties. Physical properties are important. These molecules are all real molecules you can touch. In some cases, you may have recently touched. So for example, esters are polar molecules. Most esters are liquids. Ethyl acetate here is a liquid. It's got a boiling point of 77 degrees Celsius. Many esters have sort of noticeable odors that are often pleasant and kind of kind of sweet. If you've ever smelled nail polish remover, one of the smells typically in there is ethyl acetate. Uh, if you've ever smelled any sort of uh, solvent that smells kind of like bananas, that's isoamyl acetate. Uh, wintergreen gets its characteristic smell from methyl salicylate, the methyl ester of salicylic acid, which is orthohydroxybenzoic acid. So again, this pleasant, uh, you know, but slightly pungent odor. I believe on many of these markers here, you'll have a solvent that's an ester like ethyl acetate, although now they're trying to have less volatile organic compounds in all sorts of things, in paint and markers and so forth not necessarily because the solvents are toxic, but because they contribute to smog and air pollution. So often the photochemical products of reaction of oxygen and light with organic solvents generates more toxic products or just uh, products that can be uh, damaging in the atmosphere. Anyway, the liquid is, uh, is as I said, has a boiling point of 77 degrees. Now, just to put this into context, if we look at a molecule of similar molecular weight like hexane, the boiling point is 69 degrees. If we look at a molecule of similar molecular weight and shape, again, a nonpolar molecule, we, uh, and again, I'll just point out that hexane is a liquid. So if we look at 2-methyl pentane, it's also a liquid. And it's because it's more compact, you get less van der Waals interaction. Its boiling point is 60 degrees. So the extra difference, the reason that ethyl acetate has a higher boiling point than say 2-methyl pentane is that you get extra dipole-dipole interactions. they lead to a higher boiling point. Now, because you have 
a bond dipole to, or a, a molecular dipole to the mo molecule, ethyl acetate, because it's a polar molecule and because it has not too many carbons in it, in other words, it's not too greasy, often people will look at the carbon to oxygen ratio and use four as sort of a magic number for cutoff on solubility. So here we have four carbons to two oxygens, so the ratio is, is two. The molecule is soluble in water and in fact has a moderate solubility of 8.3 grams per 100 mils in water. So that means that if you're in the laboratory and you're doing a liquid-liquid extraction, it's fine, you'll get a separate phase, a separate layer for ethyl acetate in your separatory funnel, for water in your separatory funnel, but there will be a little bit of ethyl acetate in the water and water in the ethyl acetate. If you're trying to do a liquid-liquid extraction to isolate a product, you would take the organic layer, which presumably would dissolve your nonpolar product, and you discard the aqueous layer. You then dry your organic layer over magnesium sulfate or sodium sulfate in order to then uh, prepare it for removal of the ethyl acetate and isolation of your product. And in terms of the, the dipole, on the one hand, you can just say, okay, I kind of get it that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, but I think it's really useful to think about resonance structures because I think they really show you the molecular dipole very well. And it also helps us think about reactivity and other properties of the molecule. I said that esters are less reactive than ketones or aldehydes when I presented all of the carbonyl groups, all of the members of the carbonyl family. And we can think about three different resonance structures for an ester group. Certainly the main resonance structure is going to be the one that I wrote on the left-hand side. But to make a more complete set, we can recognize that the carbonyl group is not share and share alike. Oxygen, it's a polar covalent bond. Oxygen is more electronegative. The ele electrons spend more time near the oxygen of the carbonyl group. But then, uh, and so I can write the second resonance structure, but then the third oxygen, the other oxygen has a pair of electrons to share. And so I can write yet another resonance structure like so. And together these make up a more complete picture of the ester group. They show some of that polarity in the molecule. You can see how it can interact with polar molecules. And I'll just remind us that these two structures here are minor resonance structures. In other words, they're all present at once. It's not resonating or oscillating or vibrating between different structures. They're all present at once, but it's maybe 70 or 80% of the structure on the left that best describes it, and then five or 10% of each, of each of the other structures contributing. Amides are even more polar than esters. Part of that has to do with the nitrogen being able to donate in it's less the, uh, the nitrogen of the amide donating in even better to the carbonyl group. We'll see that also in the IR spectrum. But let's start with a primary amide. So let's start with acetamide as an example. Acetamide, although it's a really small organic molecule, is a solid got a melting point of 82 degrees. 
and it's got a boiling point of 221 degrees. That's high. And if you think back to freshman chemistry, and I don't know if you would still remember the analogies that got made in freshman chemistry about how special water is. Water's, ooh, my phone is supposed to be, I am sorry for that. My phone is supposed to be on automatic silence during the, during the class. I'm not sure how that worked. Anyway, anyway, the, um, <clears throat> The um, acetamide is a small molecule like water, small molecule. What's special about water is the hydrogen bonding just has a huge effect. You may have remembered that hydrogen sulfide is a gas, very toxic gas. And that comparison often gets made to show just how profound the hydrogen bonding is in water in terms of making it a liquid that boils at 100 degrees C instead of a gas or giving it a melting point that's you know, almost at room temperature that's zero degrees Celsius. And it's the same thing with amides. Acetamide is very good at hydrogen bonding. So two acetamide molecules can hydrogen bond together like so to form hydrogen bonded dimers. And you can get further hydrogen bonds. You do get further hydrogen bonds between the other NH group and other carbonyls and other molecules. So this means although the molecule is small, they stick together through hydrogen bonding, and this leads to a higher melting point and a higher boiling point than you would expect. You know, I made an analogy of, uh, of ethyl acetate to, uh, to hexane because it's the same number of heavy atoms. The number of carbons in hexane is six. The number of oxygens and carbons in ethyl acetate is six, so it's a good comparison. In the case of acetamide, we have four heavy atoms. And if you compare that to butane, which is a gas at room temperature and has a boiling point of you know, roughly zero Celsius, um, so you have to compress it to make it a liquid in your cigarette lighters, that's a huge difference in properties associated with that extra hydrogen bonding. Even in the case of NN dimethylformamide, where you no longer have hydrogen bonding, you still have a very high boiling point for a molecule of such small size. There are only five carbon at five heavy atoms, five you know carbon plus uh, plus oxygen plus nitrogen in a sediment, and yet it's a liquid with a boiling point. of 153 degrees, it decomposes. If you heat it, it, um, it does uh, break down. It's also miscible with water. And again, all of these properties, the fact that it has such a high boiling point, right? Pentane boils just at you know 30 something Celsius, just above room temperature, high 30s for the same number of heavy atoms. Um, and yet dimethyl acetamide boils at such a high temperature. And you can look at that and say, okay, I'm only gonna write, remember I can write two other resonance structures. I'll only write one of the minor resonance structures. But when I write this resonance structure, we see again that you have a big polar component to the structure of the molecule. Again, this kind of rule of four applies very well. So if I was looking at a molecule like, uh, dimethyl acetamide. It's got four carbons to two polar atoms, two oxygens and nitrogens. 
So it shouldn't surprise me that it's miscible with water. It's a liquid with a boiling point of 165. And again, it's miscible with water. I would at least expect it to be soluble. Questions or thoughts at this point? All right, the, in the, if I had to talk about properties of molecules that really were characteristic, I'd say for all of the carbonyl compounds, the thing that stands out that immediately identifies a carbonyl compound is the IR spectrum. Carbonyl groups always have a strong and prominent CO double bond stretch. And it's always around 1700. And I'll deliberately put sort of a tilde around 1700 wave numbers. But the exact carbonyl compound flavors where the carbonyl group is at. So for example, in an amide, the carbonyl group is about 1660 wave numbers. It's at a lower frequency than that of a sort of typical generic carbonyl group, like a ketone would be at about 1715, say for acetone. And you really can think of this difference from what I was talking about before from the nitrogen donating in. So again, if I'm gonna write some resonance structures, maybe I'll do this. And again, I'll skip that other resonance structure and really just come to one that I think sort of shows the special properties here in an amide we see this resonance structure, the nitrogen's pretty good at donating in. In other words, collectively, your carbon-oxygen double bond is weaker than that of a ketone. And the result is that you shift the stretching frequency to shorter wavelengths. So the weaker carbonyl leads to, um, leads to shorter wavelength, um, longer wavelength, I'm sorry. Lower wave numbers. All right, the other thing, and again, I want to point this out, and maybe I should write it out, is that that nitrogen, because of this resonance structure, it's really not sp3 hybridized because there's a significant component of this resonance structure. You can think of the nitrogen as being more like sp2 hybridized. If I wanted to be more exact, it's somewhere between sp2 and sp3, but close enough to sp2 that you can think of it as sp2 hybridized. Now, I mentioned before, when we've talked about electronegative atoms like nitrogen and oxygen, it's often a little confusing the first time around because you say, well, wait a second, nitrogen's more electronegative than oxygen, isn't it pulling electrons away rather than giving back? And it's doing both. It is pulling through the sigma bond, but it's doing more than its share of giving. So it's taking through the sigma bond. 
but it's doing more than its share of giving through the pi bond through this resonance structure. In the case of oxygen, which is more electronegative than nitrogen, it does, at least as far as the IR spectrum, take a little bit more than it gives. But in terms of the weakness of the carbonyl, it's still, uh, it's still a, a less reactive carbonyl. Anyway, we're at 1735 or thereabouts wave numbers for a typical ester group. Now, those differences aren't, the difference between an ester and a ketone isn't super important in the IR, although I guarantee you that my and Matt and Jason, having come through my graduate level spectroscopy course, can tell them apart, but the amides really do stand out. Another one that really stands out is acid chlorides. Acid chlorides are, as I said, super reactive. In the IR spectrum, the carbonyl group is at 1800 wave numbers. And that means actually that the carbonyl, this is a little counterintuitive, even though it is more reactive, the carbonyl group, actually it's a stronger CO bond And you can kind of think of it this way. You can think that the chlorine is doing more taking than it's giving. Not only is chlorine electronegative, but chlorine is in the third row of the periodic table, which doesn't do pi bonding very well and doesn't overlap with carbon very well. So this type of resonance structure that I wrote for nitrogen is not a big contributor in the case of the acid chloride. So the chlorine is doing more of this taking through the sigma bond and much less donation through the pi bond. And you can kind of think of that taking as the chlorine is pulling electrons away with its electronegativity, its bond dipole, and the oxygen is compensating by coming down. But if nothing else, keep in mind, basically, you have this very characteristic higher wave number stretch, substantially higher wave number out of that sort of 1700 to 1750 range. That's sort of your typical aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, um, and esters. Amides are substantially lower acid chlorides are substantially higher. The other ones that stand out are acid anhydrides. Acid anhydrides, again, you have the oxygen now getting tugged on. It can't donate as well into two uh, carbonyl groups. It's more reactive than an ester. And in the IR, you see a higher frequency stretch. You actually get two stretches in the IR, you get an 1820 and a 1760, thereabouts anyway, wave number stretch in the IR. If you wanted to think simplistically, you could say, oh, it's because I have two carbonyl groups but it's actually what's called coupled vibrations where the two vibrations, the two stretches work in sync in concert and you get what's called an asymmetric and a symmetric stretch. I've assigned some homework and you'll get a chance to see more of the spectra of the molecules that we're talking about in this chapter when you get to the part of the homework. I don't want to say much about the NMR. We already talked about the NMR of the methyl group in say ketones and aldehydes. And I said, okay, sort of a generic rule of thumb, and this really applies to pretty much all carbonyl compounds, is if you have a methyl group alpha to the carbonyl, that term alpha, that term alpha comes up again, 
if you have a methyl group alpha to the carbonyl, you, it shows up at about two ppm for the methyl group. And if you have a CH, it's at about, you know, so if it's a CH of some sort, it's somewhere between two and 2.5 or three parts per million. And that's, of course, in the H1 NMR. And again, sort of in general, in the C13 NMR, to sort of generalize all of these, I would say your carbonyl is about 160 to 180 um, ppm in the C13 NMR. All right, any questions at this point about the spectroscopic or other properties of the uh, carboxylic acid family members? Yeah, oh, that's stretch in the back row. All right, let's talk, let's talk now, because I think a lot of the fun is in reactions and reactivity. And I want to sort of give some general principles. Just making a mess of this. All right, so if I wanted to talk about some general principles, I would say carboxylic acid chlorides are the most reactive. And they're more reactive than acid anhydrides. You can abbreviate an acid anhydride as R2COO. It's a nice shorthand to show two carbonyl groups, two RCO groups bound to an oxygen. That's more reactive than esters. And again, you'll see you'll, esters and carboxylic acids written lots of ways. You'll see them written out with bonds. You'll see them written as RCOOH or RCOOR. You'll see them written as RCO2R or RCO2H. Anyway, Esters and finally amides. And for that matter, uh, nitriles are sort of the least reactive. And what do I mean by that? I mean that even weak nucleophiles, even nucleophiles that are not strongly basic, where the conjugate acid, the pK of the conjugate acid is a big number, react with acid chlorides. So for example, if I take acetyl chloride and I put it into water, it reacts. And at least for acid chloride, for acetyl chloride, it reacts rather violently meaning it sizzles and spatters, boils because it's a low boiling liquid, and we get give rise to the corresponding carboxylic acid plus HCl. Acid anhydrides react with water. and you get the corresponding carboxylic acid. So for example, one molecule of acetic anhydride yields two molecules of acetic acid. That's why we're gonna be talking about acid chlorides and acid anhydrides together because they sort of share common reactivity. Esters for the most part 
don't react with water. If I had to characterize the reaction of esters with water, I'd say no reaction. Ethyl acetate doesn't hydrolyze in water. It's not quite true. If I dissolve up ethyl acetate in water and come back a year later or a month later, some of it will be ethyl alcohol, some of it will be acetic acid, but nothing that occurs sort of rapidly on the, I mix them together and a few hours later is a reaction, a reaction has occurred. Amides even more so, Amides are the proteins in your body. Amides are the lens in your eye where those proteins are around your entire life. So in other words, amides just do not react with water, right? You'd be in big trouble if the water in your tears hydrolyzed the lens of your eyes during the course of your lifetime. You may get cataracts, but you're not gonna have your lens dissolve. So proteins and amides last even longer. All right, so that's sort of a feeling of what I mean by this hierarchy of reactivity that acid chlorides and acid anhydrides are way more reactive than uh, esters and amides. All right, the other broad principle, which we see a little bit of here, is all members of the carboxylic acid family can be interconverted. with suitable reagents, catalysts, et cetera. And that's a good thing to keep in mind because even though we're not going to learn every reaction of members of the carboxylic acid family, there are reactions that will take one to another. So for example, we won't cover how to convert acetamide to acetonitrile, to convert a primary amide to a nitrile, but you might even be able to envision a reaction that could do this, even though you won't have learned the reaction. The general principle that we will talk about is if we have a generic member of the carboxylic acid family, I'll just write it as RCOX, and a nucleophile, I'll write it as NU minus or NUH. it will react by a nucleophilic substitution reaction under some conditions, but they may not be simply mixing things. So the reaction that I sort of wrote out before when we introduced sort of the broad chemistry of the group, back when we talked about carbonyl compounds, you could say goes to X plus, uh, nucleophilic substitution plus X minus or HX in the most abstract sense. And then if I want to try to make some sense of this, I could say um, sort of reaction would occur with basic nucleophiles. So in other words, species like hydroxide or, um, or alkoxide or um, even amines, under some conditions, 
generally can react, although as I pointed out, in the case of carboxylic acids, amines are gonna just generate a salt, but again, that's a reaction. Um, so in other words, basically, whether it's um, an ester or whether it's an acid chloride, hydroxide or alkoxide or dimethylamine is going to react under some conditions just by mixing them. But on the other hand, if I have um, something that uh, is less of a good electrophile, uh, less of a good nucleophile than a good electrophile would react. So I'd say reaction occurs with basic nucleophiles or good electrophiles. Meaning uh, really acid chlorides or acid anhydrides. And in the case of weakly basic nucleophiles, if these abstractions don't completely make sense now, don't worry, this is an overarch of what we're about to see in the rest of the chapter. So in the case of weakly basic nucleophiles like uh, alcohols and water, they can react with less reactive electrophiles. With strong acid catalysis. And so we got a little bit of a flavor of this. If you remember, I was talking about the chemistry of nitriles, and I got into this point that in the case of cooking up, of boiling a nitrile in a strong acid like sulfuric acid, you will get hydrolysis first to the acetamide for, for acetonitrile, and then further hydrolysis to acetic acid and ammonia or ammonium ion. That would be an example. All right, let's start in though with some concrete examples because I think that's going to help make sense of all of this. So let's take a look at an incontroversially reactive electrophile. Acetyl chloride, I just said, sizzles with water. So even a weak nucleophile it reacts with. And let's take a look at the reaction with dimethylamine. So dimethylamine and acetyl chloride reacts to form dimethyl acetamide. And if I wanted to write a really balanced equation and sort of really figure things out, I would probably say two molecules of di, whoops, two molecules of dimethylamine react with acetyl chloride to give a molecule of diethyl acet dimethyl acetamide plus a molecule of dimethyl ammonium chloride. That's a lousy CL. I'm going to write it a little less stylized. All right. So that's an example of where we're going. Now, in terms of getting there, you already have all of the skills you need to think your way through this reaction. And so much of figuring out how reactions occur is looking at what's the nucleophile, what's the electrophile, and thinking about how they come together to form bonds. In other words, you don't have to memorize your way through a reaction mechanism. You can just think your way through to write a reasonable reaction mechanism. And so 
If you look at an acid chloride, and we've already talked about this, the carbonyl group is very electrophilic. Dimethylamine, I've mentioned, is a good nucleophile. It's got a lone pair of electrons that it would like to share. It's set up to go ahead and attack the carbonyl group. That arrow means electrons are flowing from the nitrogen to the carbonyl group. The other arrow means electrons are flowing up onto the oxygen. In other words, once this reaction occurs, we generate a species that's not going to be a final stable species. It's going to be a transient species or intermediate in which that trigonal carbon now has four substituents around it. It is now tetrahedral. And so we call this species a tetrahedral intermediate. The tetrahedral intermediate is not stable in part because the carbonyl group is very stable. The carbonyl bond overall is always very, very strong. And so the tetrahedral intermediate breaks down and kicks out chloride anion like so. To give you back your carbonyl group, so I'll write this as minus Cl minus. Your textbook may write this reaction in a slightly different order with a proton coming off first, but I don't think that detail is very important. I think my way of writing it might be a little bit more reasonable, but they're both reasonable. And in the final step, as I said, that nitrogen is not basic. It's not an amine nitrogen. It doesn't want to stay protonated, but you do have bases present and the strongest base is going to be dimethylamine. And so another molecule of dimethylamine can come along will come along and remove that proton. To give you a dimethyl ammonium ion and your, your amide. Thoughts or questions? at this point. Yeah. Ah, great, beautiful question. I'm really, really, really happy you asked that question because I don't think it's unreasonable. Your textbook might even do this. And I don't think it's unreasonable to go ahead and write the reaction this way. Here's your chloride and you could say, okay, I could envision getting HCl this way. Now, the reason I think about this as the nitrogen doing this, they're both reasonable, is chloride is very weakly basic there's going to be another molecule of amine present. Chlorine is very weakly basic. And a very good metric of this is the pKa of the conjugate acid. The pKa of HCl is somewhere around, I think it's negative seven listed in your textbook or negative six, somewhere very, very far to the negatives. The pKa of dimethyl ammonium is on the order of 
10 or 11. In other words, remember, pKa becomes the surrogate. pKa of the conjugate acid becomes a surrogate for the basicity of the base. Dimethylamine is 10 to the 17th times more basic than hydrogen chloride. And so if you envision a competition with dimethylamine or chloride, the dimethylamine is going to win. But I don't think it's completely unreasonable to write chloride coming off this way. In fact, sometimes what I will do, particularly, particularly if I'm among my, my research group and we're just sort of talking, is just write it as minus H plus. I don't recommend that at this stage in the game in writing mechanisms, because I think you want to sort of go slow. And as I said on problem two on the exam, I was really happy to see everyone uh, you know, do a nice job, almost everyone do a nice job. But this is one way you could think about it. Great question. Other questions, other thoughts? All right, now for this very reason, Okay, dimethylamine is readily available, but for this very reason, often you want to use a sacrificial base. And so sometimes we add an, an extra base like triethylamine or pyridine. is used as a base. To allow one equivalent of the amine to be used. Of say a precious amine to be used. So I'll give you um, maybe a slightly different example. We'll deal with uh, an ester formation. If I take benzoyl, benzoyl chloride, I can allow it to react in ethanol. If I dissolve it in ethanol, I would get ethyl benzoate plus HCl. But if I were carrying out this reaction in the laboratory, I would probably go ahead and add pyridine as a base for various reasons to facilitate the reaction to react with the HCl that's produced. I would probably add pyridine as a base And again, organic chemists are terribly bad about writing byproducts of a reaction, but we would generate the pyridinium hydrochloride as our byproduct of reaction. That would be very, very typical. Or if I took benzoyl chloride and I wanted to treat it with my favorite amine, maybe I would take some precious, semi-precious, molecule like uh, glycine ethyl ester, I might carry out this reaction with pyridine and then go ahead and use just one equivalent. To generate this amide here. or questions. All right, let's take a look at some other reactions of acid chlorides and acid anhydrides. So as I said before, acetyl chloride sizzles with water. I generate acetic acid plus HCl. 
And again, you don't need to be able to memorize every reaction. You can just think your way through. Oh, okay. The water, it, the acetyl chloride is really electrophilic. The water must attack the acetyl chloride. I must get a tetrahedral intermediate. The tetrahedral intermediate must break down. I must take a proton off of the water to get the carboxylic acid and HCl or H3O plus. And similarly, you could generalize and say, okay, if I had hydroxide, hydroxide is a good nucleophile. If I had hydroxide, I would go ahead. And of course that could be sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide. I'd go ahead and get the carboxylic acid, but I probably would have excess hydroxide. So I would probably go ahead and say, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and I will get the carboxylate salt and H2O because once I got the carboxylic acid, it would further break down to, uh, or further react with hydroxide in an acid-base reaction to yield acetic, uh, to yield acetate anion. You could also generalize, and this is where I talk, of where I was talking about how all of the groups can be reactive, uh, can, can be interconverted, and how some groups are more reactive than others. So I said sort of at the very top of the hierarchy of reactivity, at the very top of the hierarchy of reactivity of electrophilicity is acid chlorides. So almost any nucleophile is gonna react with an acid chloride. So even if I haven't seen a reaction before and I imagine something like sodium acetate and I say, wait a second, what's sodium acetate gonna do with acetyl chloride? I haven't seen this reaction before. You'd say, okay, I can think my way through it. That acid chloride's an electrophile the acetate's a nucleophile, it has electrons to share. The acetate's gonna attack the acid chloride. I'm gonna get a tetrahedral intermediate. The tetrahedral intermediate is going to break down. And at the end of the day, I'm going to have acetic anhydride. And if again, if I wanna be a good person and balance my equation, sodium chloride gives me a balanced equation. And those reactivities really track with pKa's. So the reactivity of an acid chloride, as I said, it's sort of at the king of reactivity in the carboxylic acid family. The leaving group is chloride. The conjugate acid of chloride is HCl. The pKa of HCl is negative seven. In other words, that chloride is a very good leaving group. The acid chloride is very reactive with electrophiles. And you notice those layers of thinking. It's hard the first time around. Wait a second, I'm juggling all of this. The leaving group, the pK of the conjugate acid, the quality of the leaving group. And once you get used to it, basically that's a good way of thinking. And you look at say an acid anhydride, And you say, okay, same thought processes. Our leaving group is the acetate or the carboxylate anion. The conjugate acid is a carboxylic acid. The pKa is four to five. And so you compare negative seven 
to four to five and you say, wow, that leaving group is many orders of magnitude better. It's 11, 12 orders of magnitude better leaving group. No wonder those acid chlorides are so, so reactive. We come along to an ester And again, you think in the same way, okay, our leaving group is the alcohol. The pKa of the alcohol is 16 to 18. Again, like huge number, like 12 orders of magnitude difference in reactivity. Again, why an acid anhydride reacts with water. An acid chloride sizzles in water, reacts more rapidly but an ester for the most part sits there. And down sort of at the very bottom of the hierarchy, if you look at an amide, and again, you consider the pKa of the conjugate base of the leaving group, and the pKa is about negative 38 or negative, uh, is about 38 or 40. Again, you'd say, okay, now much less reactive. And we even saw this in various reactions with, um, say, hydride nucleophiles, where a hydride nucleophile was uh, like sodium borohydride would be good enough to reduce an acid chloride or a ketone or aldehyde, which I said are more reactive than esters, but not good enough to reduce an ester, why we had to go to a much stronger reducing agent like lithium aluminum hydride. And it's all the same principle. Questions, thoughts? I've been skirting around uh, carboxylic acids, again, because they have that acidic proton. So we'll see in some cases, they can be a little bit special. Fundamentally, carboxylic acids, right? pK of water is 15.7. So carboxylic acids are like esters, but with a base, remember we get acid-base chemistry. So if you add, say, an amine to a carboxylic acid, then you get the corresponding carboxylate anion. And here you'd say, oh, okay, now I have to think of the conjugate base of O minus, or I have to think of the leaving group, right? The leaving group would be O two minus, and that's just not, not a leaving group, right? And so again, the take home message is carboxylic acids react with acid bases in acid base chemistry. Oops, as. As an acid. With basic nucleophiles. All right, maybe the last thing I want to do just is show a couple of more examples with anhydrides. I'll take acetic anhydride. As I said, you'll see this abbreviated or written as AC2O. And again, all in the same principle, we'll take dimethylamine as an example. Acetic anhydride would react with dimethylamine to give the methyl amide, dimethyl acetamide. And if I really wanna think and balance my equation, I'd say, okay, we'd have two dimethylamines here and we would have methyl ammonium acetate 
And again, keeping up with this same principle, if I wanted to go ahead and conserve my amine, I might add an extra base. So I might go ahead and say, all right, I'm going to carry out this reaction in the presence of, I'll write this. I'm actually going to write this this other way. I think this will be more useful. I might carry out this reaction in the presence of pyridine. Oops, I am not doing well here. And I would go ahead and generate my dimethyl amide product. So that might be a preparative reaction. Yeah, Matt. So we have a question from Matthew. Yeah. Ah, okay. We will finish with a question from the chat and we've come to the end. So the, the question is about acid fluorides and acid bromides. And the short answer is yes. Both of these compounds react in a very similar fashion to acid chlorides. Slight differences, fluorine donates in a little bit more, but is electronegative, but very electronegative. Bromine overlaps, pi donates even less. So yes, for first order approximation, all of these react like acid chlorides in their reactivity. And a great example of generalization in practice, not nearly as widely used in preparative organic, synthetic organic chemistry, but absolutely. Great question. Kudos on the chat. Have a great day. We will pick up next time uh, talking about our continuing our discussion of reactions of the carboxylic acid family. Have a good weekend. Bye now.